fire hydrant worth of information as last Shabbat was. And um, so without further ado, we'll get started. Archaeology. I don't decipher archaeology. I don't have any expertise in archaeology. I'll just say one thing. The community that had been burying its dead in Qumran has a big cemetery. Tiny bit of this cemetery had been dug. I don't think we're allowed to make presumptions on account of huge cemetery, which only very little of it had been. And as I said, I don't do archaeology. I'm looking on text, not on not on remains, not on stones. That's a whole science of its own. I leave it to people who are experts in archaeology. <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Do you think that the, uh, the archaeological findings, not in the caves, but uh, the stones that indicate uh, pools and uh, kitchens and dining rooms, do you think that they have nothing to do actually with the scrolls that Well, I would never say that I think that they have nothing to do. What I say is, the scrolls represent various communities, and they have been written in various periods. As I said time and again, different genres, different hands, different periods. I think it won't be wise to assume that all what is presented in the scroll, which is so rich, had to be eliminated to the findings of the archaeological site, which might be a Hashmonian fortress, which might be a place of making paper. You know, anyone who reads an archaeology of Quran, there are 12, 13 different uh, theories to explain the one archaeological site. As I said, I don't do archaeology. I don't feel that I have the expertise for that. But I would suggest that if we have 500 hands who had written these scrolls, we should not assume that they all had lived there. I would say this is a place like a library or like a place that you keep very dear treasures to you. But I won't say that we should overlap the archaeological site with the content of the scrolls. I would not separate it totally, but I would not think that we should overlap it for 100 percent. Yes, please. Uh, could you kindly raise your voice? No, I said there are no mention of paradise, which is very important, of Enoch, of angels, of solar calendar, and Jerusalem and Jerusalem Mount Zion as the holy place. Well, thank you for asking. So that would allow me to say the one thing that time did not permit before. Uh, after the destruction of the second temple, there had been a profound change of the guard. Whoever was officiating in the temple, whether it was before the Hashmonite priests for 120 years, later on Herodian priests, later on, uh, you know, the different chapters in the history of Judea in the first century of the Common Era, after that, after the destruction of the temple, everything had changed. There is no more temple and there is no more priestly service. A new group is emerging. Of course, it had all their roots, but a new group is emerging to the forefront. They are called Pharisees, which is derived from the word lifrosh lahem al pi Adonai, which means to interpret according to the biblical site. It is derived from the root lifrosh, which means to interpret. Okay? That they were new interpreters of the canonized law. The Bible was not canonized before the second century of the Common Era, as 24 books. It had been canonized in the age of Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Yoshua after Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Those are the Pharisees, which later on had been called rabbis or Tanaim. They have various names, but the common denominator to all of that is one. They do not allow to write. They insist on oral teaching. 
They don't allow to create new books. They insist on new innovative interpretations of the highest profound kind. But we should say that in order to allow free interpretation, they had to canonize the Bible. So they would say, out of the various scriptures which might have been available, we chose the 24 books, 24 and no more. We know from the Talmud that there have been arguments if the book of Ezekiel should be in, if the book of Song of Songs should be in, if Esther should be in. The final 24 books of the canon were the closure of creative sacred writings or creative holy scriptures according to the rabbis. They did not allow any continuity of writing. Now, there were many books which were not chosen to be within the biblical canon, such as the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jubilees, the Book of the Twelve Tribes, the Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice, the Temple Scroll. All of them are sacred writings, with no exception. All of them are talking about heavenly issues, angelic issues, divine commandment, halachic things. However, they were excluded. Why would they exclude, be excluded? Because the rabbis, so to say, had decided that any book which is focusing on priests and angels and there's any allusion to this 364 days calendar would be deemed as Sfarim Chitzonim, which means the books which are left outside, the external books. We call them in English pseudoepigrapha or apocrypha, but in Hebrew it's more precise. It's the books which were left outside. They were left outside by Rabbi Akiva, who is telling us in the Sanhedrin, anyone who will read in the external books, those which were left outside, has no share in the world to come. That's a very strong act of censorship. However, those books which were left outside are the books that we had found in the Qumran library. Now, we know this dispute as the dispute between Pharisees and Sadducees. In Hebrew, Pushim Vetzdukim. Sadducees are the priests from the house of Tzadok. That's all what it means, Sadducees. Later on, they had bad reputation because of their role in the New Testament, because of their fighting with the rabbis. But the priests from the house of Tzadok, who had written and who had officiated in the temple for a thousand years before, the common era, had their own memory, had their own visual perception, had their own conceptual world, and they fought for it. The rabbi said, any book with 364 days calendar, any book with priest angels, any book about Levi, about the sons of Levi, about the work of Levi, and so on, would be, of course, outside. There is no need for that for other generations. We chose those books that we believe that would be meaningful for later generations. We won't choose the temple scroll because it is not relevant. There is no more temple. We won't choose the priestly watches scroll, the scroll of priestly watches because there are no more priestly watches, because there is no more temple. So we can explain why they left them outside, but it hasn't been noted enough that all what's important to the priest is utterly put aside in the rabbinical new literature. I'll give one example to make it uh, understandable. The word covenant, brit, is one of the most frequent words in the scrolls of the, in the, scrolls of the Dead Sea. The covenant between God and his people, God and the priest, uh, people of Israel and God. The word covenant is a major word. The word covenant in that meaning is completely erased from the Mishnah. There is no such word anymore. So as I said, what is central in the priestly literature is unseen or unwitnessed in the new rabbinical emerging literature. They had a new agenda. The priests were overlooked. When they describe the chain of transmission of the Torah, they don't mention this. They don't mention the priest at all. They deleted them. In the Bible it is said that the Torah has to be taught and transmitted by the priest. Very, very clearly it is said so. Moses says so to to his tribal brothers, the Levites, that they should teach the statutes of ja to the people of Jacob, to the people of Israel, the law to the people of Jacob, and so on. It is obvious that the priests in the Bible are entrusted with the biblical transmission of the law. According to the rabbis in the chapter of the fathers, they were never priests at all in the biblical transmission. So what they care, what one group care a great deal, the other group erased altogether. Yes, please. Between the what? I find the differentiation between the scrolls and the PC yeah. is convincing. But what I don't understand are you, are you suggesting then that, this, that the house of Sado or the Judicial Justice Sadducees are then the authors of the scrolls? Um, that, and do we have any independent textual knowledge of this house of Sado and their literature? Well, what I suggest is only what is written in the scrolls. The scrolls mention time and again, time and again, the priests from the house of Tzadok and their allies. Thousand times. I mean, it is mentioned time and again, time and again. 
the priests of the house of Tzadok and their allies. Now, I don't say, not at all, that only the Tzadokite priests had written it. Of course not. Prophets were writing, poets were writing, people of different talents and inspiration and prophetic knowledge were certainly among the authors, as we know from the biblical library. However, what I say is that wherever there is any uh, direct description of the people that should be addressed, the people who are, de- who are defined as the priests of the house of Tzadok and their allies is always in the forefront. So when, the, when you look on the scroll of blessings, who should be blessed? First of all, the high priest from the house of Tzadok. Second, who should be blessed? The priest from the house of Tzadok and their allies. The third one is the uh, pr- president of Israel or something like that. So they are always in the forefront. They are the leadership. They signify biblical Israel ideal priestly leadership. As I said, I don't know if it ever has been such the case, but we do know from the Bible that the only high priest, the only high priests that were serving were from the high priest of the house of Tzadok. That is a well-known stuff. When Ezekiel is talking in the last chapters of his book, 4048, on the future temple, he's talking on the high priest from the house of Tzadok, those which are close to God and chosen by him. No other group is described in these words. So the people who had written these scrolls were very much interested in the priestly lore, in the priestly legends, in the priestly myths, in the temple worship. That was their backbone. That was their focal, that was their focus. That was their most intrinsic interest. And we should respect it. We shouldn't say the priestly nature of the scrolls doesn't matter. It matters because it is everywhere there. We shouldn't say that this is secondary. It's not secondary. It's primary. We can find evidence on holy time via calendar, on holy time and ritual via priestly watches, on holy ritual via temple sacrifices and stuff in every page that you would open. So it is for them the only common denominator that you can say about the scrolls that have been found along the shores of the Dead Sea is that they were kept and authored and reserved and transmitted by people who believed in the ideal biblical Israel and in the complete responsibility of people who associate themselves with this conservative past, with the priestly house of Tzadok, to continue to believe and to work on those ideas which have been completely pushed away to oblivion. In the day that the United Nations had declared on the state of Israel in 1947, these scrolls were found in the very same day. As like a long shalom, a long uh, greetings from ancient past. In the very same day where the United Nations had declared about the acknowledgement of a new state of, as the state of Israel, these scrolls were first introduced. So. They were in oblivion for 2,000 years and more. They were unknown. They were certainly not the central part of Jewish memory. But I would like to respect the other memories, the alternative memory, the shreds of memory that were entered to oblivion. And yet they have, we have recovered them by a miracle, you know, by a chance. It's wonderful that they have been recovered. We should pay attention to the other memories, to the other mythologies, to the other point of interest and focus of devotion, which had informed the Jewish people of the two centuries before the Common Era and of the few decades of the first uh, of the first era, I believe that we should take a lesson from there. There was never one authoritative Jewish community. There was always splinters. There was always disputes. There was always disagreement. However, if you would ask, what is the one single thing? that the Jews shared always, it was their capacity to read and write. They may use it for belligerent writing, they may use it for all kinds of fights, but they would always say, we have sacred writings, we have holy scriptures, we can read and we can recreate and we can comment and we can do exegesis and we can do law, but we can also do myths and mysticism. We are free people to write, although we were told by Rabbi Akiva that we should not read the external books. We had read them somewhere or another during the centuries. Many of them we were not familiar with. Now we are lucky to live in a century that they are easily available to anyone who is interested in ancient history and in the way that one one can cross the waves of waves and turmoils of historical destiny. We'll conclude here. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here with you, and I would like to start by thanking Avi, sorry, uh, 
<laughs> Ari Katz and Avi Margalit and all the distinguished members of the uh, organization that had facilitated this series of lectures. Thank you, all of you, for supporting and taking interest in. This is the one topic that everybody knows something about, because anyone who has any affiliation with Jewish life knows something about the Jewish calendar. But I would like to challenge this idea and to ask you a very simple question. When does a Jewish year start? But before we would ask that, before I would ask that, I would like to say one previous sentence. The great British, the great Jewish British philosopher, Sir Isaiah Berlin, was asked, what is the uniqueness of the Jewish people? Or what is the problem of the Jewish people? He said in a very short sentence, they have far too much history and they have far too little geography. I think this is, <laughs> I think that's rather insightful observation because the fact that we don't have enough geography is well proven every day but the fact that we have too much history is really meaningful and unique what does it mean that anything that we're going to say had been challenged through three millennia the Jewish people were around for three millennia. It means that whatever was considered proper by one group of Jews in a certain time was challenged and deconstructed by other groups of Jews in other times. We need to learn to live with differences, with many voices, with challenges, with disputes. That's the way it always was. It's, only, it's not only Jews of today who are disagreeable, who are controversial, who are partial and impartial and so on. That was the situation always. And that's a blessing thing because only literate people can spend time with arguments, with challenging, with criticism, with change. All those things are vital part of Jewish history because people who are literate, and the Jewish people were always literate, people who are literate take the freedom to ask, to criticize, to challenge, to reform, to think, and to recreate. That being said, let us start by asking, as I said, when does a Jewish year start? Yes. Yeah, that's very good. The first, of, the first of Nissan. So why all the respectable Jews who are sitting here are celebrating Rosh Hashanah? Now, why? This is a serious question. This is no fun. Why all of us are well familiar with Rosh Hashanah in first of Tishrei and nobody celebra celebrating first of Nissan? The Torah asserts explicitly this month, the month of the spring, is the head of the month or is the first of the month. It is well described in the book of Exodus, chapter 12, that the year should start in the first of Nisan, the month of the spring. Why Jews today are celebrating the beginning of the year in the first of the seventh month? How come? Since when? Why? Who had made the change? Before I would offer the answer, I would like to remind you that the first thing that the French Revolution had done was to change the calendar. They had been living, as everybody else in Europe, according to the calendar, the Julian calendar and the, uh, the Georgian calendar, for many, many years. But the first thing they had done, they had, in the eve of the revolution, they had shot the clocks on the churches and they said that signifies the end of the old time and the beginning of a new time. What was the first thing the Russian Revolution activists had done? They had changed the calendar. They said this is the end of the old age and the beginning of the new age. Something of that sort had happened with us. Something of a revolution had taken place in Jewish history where a group of people had decided that it's about time to end the old time and to start a new time. But when you change a calendar, it's much more than a calendar. It's perception, it is history, it is set of priorities, it's principles, it's cultural context, it's a whole lot. It's much more than a principle of calculation. And I would like to elaborate a little bit on how this process had taken place. I would start by asking you where the holiday Rosh Hashanah is first mentioned. Where is it mentioned? Where? It is not mentioned in the Bible. It is not mentioned in the Bible. There is no such holiday. The Bible knows a holiday known as Day of Memorial or Day of the, day of the Trumpets, Yom Zikaron Tua, the day of memorial where trumpets are being blown. But what does it signify? Where is this day of memorial? Is it the only day of memorial? Now things are complicated because this day of memorial is nowhere to be 
attached to the beginning of the year. This is an innovation. But before we will discuss the innovation, let us take a look on what is a Jewish calendar in the first millennium. The Jewish calendar that we know today is 2,000 years old. But before the last 2,000 years, we had a complicated calendar, which was the temple calendar for 1,000 years. How do we know that? In 1947, the treasure of the Dead Sea Scrolls was found by accident. Among the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have 930 holy scriptures. All the Dead Sea Scrolls are holy scriptures. They contain parallels of the biblical library with differences. The major difference between the biblical tradition as we know it and the biblical tradition has been, has, has been found among the Dead Sea Scrolls is the issue of the calendar. I'll say it one more time. The Dead Sea Scrolls has all the biblical books with the exception of the book of Esther. Some, some of the books are perfect, some of the books are torn, some of the books are only shreds, but it has a representation of all the biblical library. When we make a comparison between the Dead Sea Scroll biblical library and the traditional Bible as we know it, the most noticeable difference between the biblical traditional books and the biblical books as they have been found among the Dead Sea Scrolls is the issue of the calendar. What is the calendar in the Dead Sea Scrolls? In various representations in many books, it has the following idea. Time is holy. Time is eternal, time is pre-calculated, and time is based on a solar calendar. I'll explain each one of those things. Time is eternal, it means that not, it's not for humans to dictate time. Time is eternal, and it had been brought from heaven to earth by Enoch, son of Jared, the seventh of the, uh, patri the, seventh of the patriarchs of the world in the first ten generations, number seven. Um, on Enoch, it had been said that he was walking with God, unlike the others, other people who are mentioned in Genesis chapter 5, on whom all it is, had been said that they were born to a certain father, they gave birth to certain children, and they were taken to heaven, they were, uh, they were accomplished their life and died. On Enoch, it had been said that he was taken to heaven. On the question why, it's only Enoch who was taken to heaven. The first book of Enoch, the second book of Enoch, and the third book of Enoch are telling us that he was taken to heaven in order to study the calendar. What did he study? What did he learn? From whom did he learn? That's a topic for a whole lecture. I would just sum up in a very short way. Enoch learned that the calendar has 364 days, which are divided equally to four quarters of 91 days. Each one of those 91 days has 13 Sabbaths in it, and and altogether, since we have four quarters of 91 days each, we have 52 Sabbaths every year. This is a pre-calculated calendar referring to the solar calendar of 365 days. But it is not 365, it's 364. Why? Moses had told us that the Jews are, as you know, amkshe oref, are uh, troublesome. They couldn't be like everybody else talking about 365 days calendar. They had to have 364. Why is that? Because they needed a calendar that is divided by seven, a calendar of Shabbat, a calendar of Sabbath, that would reflect the unique Jewish unit of time, which is the unit of seven days. It is of the highest importance to understand it, because Jewish time is consisted of two different systems. The audible time and divisible time. Audible time refers to number seven. Anything which has to do with seven is audible time. Every seven days is a Sabbath. Every first seven months of the year, a year starts in Pesach, in the, holiday, in the months of Pesach, every first seven months of the year, there are seven holidays. All the biblical holidays are all in the first seven months of the year, between the months of the spring to the months of the autumn, from the first to the seven months. All the holidays, together with the 52 Saturdays are consisting of 70 days. Every seventh year there is a sabbatical and every seven sevenths of year there is a jubilee. The common denominator to all those sevenfold calculation is that none of them is visible. All those distinctions are audible and they are the content of the covenant. This is explicitly said in the book of Jubilees and in the book of Enoch, and it is well asserted in the Bible, of course, but usually we don't consider that in this system, that sevenfold time is the time of the covenant. And what is the content of this seven time division? It is that every seven days, every seven holidays, every seven months, every seventh year and every seven sevenths of year, we have to resign our sovereignty, we have to stop working, we have to decline all human rights to change nature, because that's 
the meaning of Shabbat, Shemitah, and Jubilee? Shemitah is a fallow year, Shemitah is the sabbatical year. The meaning of those time divisions is that human beings are giving up their right to work, to change, to make money, to affect nature. They are striking from work. They are Shabbating, if you wish to make it a, a verb. They are not doing anything. They are doing only one thing. They are convening together to study the law. Because in the seven festivals of the Lord, and in every Sabbath, and in the Jubilee year, and the uh, sabbatical year, the idea is that you are not working, but you are taking the free time in order to study. We may want to reflect on the following fact. In antiquity, there were many nations which were far stronger and far bigger than the Jewish people. Assyrians, Babylonians, Egyptians, not Egypt of today, but hieroglyphic Egyptians, all those were mighty people, highly cultured people. No one today is speaking Assyrian. Nobody is cursing in Babylonian. Nobody is writing poetry in hieroglyphic Egyptian. Nobody is speaking Prezite, Jebusite, all those languages of the seven people of Canaan. The only people from antiquity in this part of the world that are speaking the language of their fathers is, are the Jewish people who are capable to read Hebrew, to speak Hebrew, to talk in Hebrew. Why is that? Because of this system of the audible cycles of time, when you don't work and you convene together to hear the law, when you teach your children to read, when you teach the whole community to listen to the divine word. In order to have those free time cycles, for that we need the sevenfold cycle of the audible divisions of time. Now, at the same time, we have another division of time. It is called the visible circle of time. If the first division, the sevenfold division, is the division of the covenant, which is directed only towards the Jewish people who are members of the covenant, who are accepting the covenant, the other kind of time, the visible time, is equally shared with all other humans on the world. The visible time is not Jewish time, it is universal time. Visible time is all divisions of time that we can see with our eyes. Sunrise and sunset, the moon and the spring and the autumn and winter and summer, all divisions that we can distinct through our sight. That kind, of, that kind of time is called the chariots of heaven, Merkavot Shamaim. The first division of time, the sevenfold cycles, is called Moadei Dolo, times of liberty. Times of liberty are only given to the Jewish people. The chariot of heaven, which are the eternal cycles of changing of the seasons, are given to all human beings. The difference is that the Jewish people were in charge on keeping those two cycles of time, the visible time and the audible time, and to synchronize between them. Those synchronization cycles were kept by the priests from the house of Tzadok, those who were serving in the temple for a thousand years. Now, how come that all those perceptions of time division were lost in oblivion? Why we don't know much about it? Why we needed the Dead Sea Scrolls to find out about it, because this time perception was marginalized, was thrown into oblivion by the revolution that was taking place in the beginning of the first millennium. But it was more complicated than that, because if for a thousand years the priests were keeping the time cycles through the holy watches, which are detailed in First Chronicles chapter 24, if they were keeping those time cycles as it is attested among the Dead Sea Scrolls, why it had stopped? What happened? Now, how it had stopped, you know without knowing it, because everybody sitting here had heard about the holiday of Hanukkah. But most of us don't know that Hanukkah is a very complicated holiday. It's not really a holiday for the priests. It's not a holiday acknowledged by the Ethiopian Jews. It's not a holiday known or acknowledged by the Samaritans or by various other Jewish cycles in antiquity. This is a questionable holiday because what it signifies is the end of the biblical world and the beginning of a new order. How did it happen? In the year 175 before the Common Era, Antiochus, the Seleucian king, had conquered Jerusalem. Seleucian kings means from the house of the Seleucus, the heirs of Alexander the Great, Alexander Mokdom, and he was from Greek origin. He had Greek education. All Greek people had been living for years according to a lunar calendar starting in the autumn, in the month of Dios, while all, while all the Jewish people were living for years according to a solar calendar starting in the spring in the month in the, on a solar calendar starting on the spring, which includes 364 days. 
When Antiochus Epiphanes, which means the one who had the divine revelation, when Antiochus Epiphanes had conquered Jerusalem in 175 before the Common Era, he demanded to celebrate his birthday according to his own calendar. He said, if I'm a king, I would like to have my birthday celebrated every month, not once a year. If I'm a king, you know, why do we like our birthday being celebrated? What do we get in birthday? Presents. Why should we get presents only once a year? We may as well get it every month if we are the king. Now he had, his idea was, if I'm the king, I may as well have things according to my own desire. My own desire was to have a birthday every month in the day of my birthday, which was the 25th of the months of deals, but he said every month in the 25th of the month, I would like to have a celebration. That's very good only. In Jerusalem, time was calculated according to a solar calendar, not according to a lunar calendar. What is the difference between a solar and a lunar calendar? Solar calendar is a pre-calculated calendar that has nothing to do with the moon, while lunar calendar is a calendar which is based on observation and not on pre-calculation. In a solar calendar, which has 364 days, you can say in advance that there are 12 months, each one of the months of the year has 30 days. Each one of the months of the year has has a date and a day that it starts. Always, always, the first month, that's the month of Nisan, the first month would start on Wednesday, the second month would start on Friday, the third month would start on Wednesday, and one more time. The fourth month would start on Wednesday, the fifth month would start on Friday, the sixth month would start on Sunday. The seventh month always would start on Wednesday, the eighth month would start on uh, Friday, and the ninth month on Sunday, and so on and so forth. So every three months would always start Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. Every month would have 30 days in the, third, in the last months, in every third, every third month, that is, the third, the sixth, the ninth, and the twelfth, you would add an extra day. So the third month would have 31 days, the sixth month would have 31 days, the ninth month would have 31 days, and the twelfth month would have 31 days. Altogether, we would have 330, 364 days, okay? First month, 30, second month, 30, third month, 31. Fourth month, 30, fifth month, 30, sixth month, 31, seventh month, 30, eighth month, 30, ninth month, 31, and so on and so forth. Every year would have 364 days, with every month starting in a day well known to us. As I said, the first month of every quarter would start on Wednesday, the second month on Friday, the third one on Sunday. Thus, we know the date of every Shabbat of the year. If the first month starts on Wednesday, inevitably the first Shabbat would be the fourth of the first month, the second Shabbat would be the eleventh of the first month, the third Shabbat would be the eighteenth, and so on and so forth. You can do the calculation, you understand the principle. Every seventh day there is a Shabbat. If you know how many days are in a month and how in what day the month starts, you can say the date of every Shabbat of the year. All the Shabbatot would be parallel in each one of the quarters, because if you start every quarter on Wednesday, the the first Shabbat would always be the fourth of the first month, the fourth of the fourth month, the fourth of the seventh month, and the fourth of the eleventh month, and it would go like that. In every quarter of 91 days, the last Shabbat would be in the 28th of the third month. Every Shabbat has a date. Every Shabbat has, every month has a pre-calculated division of time. All time is pre-calculated and has nothing to do with the moon. This is mathematical calendar pre-calculated, pre pre-deterministic, and had nothing to do with human decision. It had been brought, as I said, according to the priestly law, it had been brought from heaven by Enoch, son of Jared, was transmitted to his son Methuselah. His son Methuselah transmitted it to his son Lemech, so we are told in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Lemech had passed it to the brother of Noah, his name was Nir, and Nir had passed it to Melchizedek, the one who meets many generations afterwards, Abraham, and teach him the calendar. That's the priestly alternative memory to the biblical memory that we know. But the major thing is about the calendar. The calendar is the basis of of all Jewish memory. The calendar is the basis of the temple worship. The calendar is the foundation of the covenant. But as I said, when Antiochus came to Jerusalem in 175 before the common era, he said, I am the, I am the king and I will implement my own calendar, the Greek lunar calendar, which starts in the first moon of the autumn. It has nothing to do with pre-calculation. It has nothing to do with solar calendars. This is a different calendar. The high priest who was serving at that time, at that period, his name was Onias, son of 
שמעון, חוניו בן שמעון, had refused the king. He told him in Jerusalem in the temple, there is only one holy calendar. It is kept by the priest from the days of, from days of old, from the time that we have temple in Jerusalem, from the 10th century before the common era. We cannot change the calendar. We would do everything you want. We would bring you presents. We would do a celebration outside of the temple, but we cannot change the temple calendar. Well, the king was not tolerant, nor was he democratic. He said, behead him or, you know, kick him out of office. Onias had to run for his life. He was murdered later, but he had to run from his life. The king had nominated his brother, Yazon, Jason, who had agreed to make some kind of a compromise. It didn't work because you cannot synchronize between the solar calendar, which is pre-calculated, and the lunar calendar, which is working on observation. And it didn't work, and Jason was murdered too, and was, uh, it was hard time, and was exchanged by a, a non-priest called Menelaus, and he was exchanged by another person. His name was Alchemos, and that's the time when the Hashmonean War starts. The Hashmonean War was against the Jews who were officiating in the temple, not against the king. It was against the Mityavnim, the Hellenized Jews who had accepted Antiochus' ideas about time, which was contesting the Jewish tradition of time. There was a war between 167 to 164 before the Common Era, and the war ended because Antiochus died in Persia, far away from the war zone, and they had hoped that a new regime would start without imposition of the calendar. But that was not the case. There was a decade of chaos and different Different people and different par uh, parties were trying to conquer the uh, they were trying to conquer the temple. At the end of this chaotic uh, decade, Jonathan, the son of Matityahu, was nominated to a priest, to a high priest. It was not his position, because the high priesthood was always kept to the people of the family of Yedaya, which are direct descendants of Aaron. The Hashmoneans were not belonging to this family. Jonathan was nominated by the Greek king Alexander Ballas. His brother, Simon, was nominated by the Greek king, Demetrius. The Greek kings had demanded that the lunar calendar would be imposed. So the famous Hashmoneans, which are usually delineated as heroes and as liberators, were no heroes and no liberators. In fact, they were traitors from the point of view of the priests. They called them sons of darkness because they accepted the lunar calendar. They didn't have a choice. If the, the king said, if you want to officiate in the temple, you have to accept the lunar calendar. Those who resented this compromise were called the priests from the house of Tzadok, or the Zadokite later. They were calling themselves sons of light. The difference between light and darkness was the difference between solar calendar and lunar calendar. If you accepted the solar calendar, these 364 days, you were sons of light. If you accepted the lunar calendar, the one that had no, no fixed number of days, you were sons of darkness. The war between sons of light and sons of darkness, sons of darkness, was the internal Jewish war between people who had kept to the ancient order of the temple holy time and people who made compromise with the new political situation where the Greek kings had imposed their will on Jerusalem and on the land through the Hashmoneans who were officiating as priests. The old priesthood, the Zadokite priesthood, had resented it profoundly. They hated the new unofficiated priest. And the new priesthood, the uh, Hashmoneans, had hated the old priesthood, the Zadokite priest. It was an internal Jewish fight, a very profound fight. At the end of it, the Romans came and had made a new decision. For 120 years, the Hashmonean kings were ruling in a very horrible way. They were assassinating each other. They were assassinating mothers and brothers. They were imposing Greek culture in various ways, and they were much resented by the members of the old regimes who defined themselves Hakohanim Bnei Tzadok Ve'anshei Britam, the priests from the house of Tzadok and the members of their covenant. For 120 years, they were fighting not with swords, with literature. Much of the literature that had been found among the 930 scrolls of the, in the Dead Sea scrolls is the literature written by the priests from the house of Tzadok against the priests from the house of Hashmonai. But in the year 60, 100, sorry, 
in the year 67 before the Common Era, the Romans were conquering Jerusalem according to the invitation of one of the kings of the Hashmonians who was fighting with his brothers. Antigonus and Aristobulus were fighting with each other. One of them had summoned the Roman soldiers who were in Syria. Rome had conquered the land of Israel in the year 67 before the Common Era. The Romans had their own idea about how time should be calculated because every new regime has its own ideas what time should be like, what calendar should be like. You all, you're all familiar with the result of the Roman conquest because you're all familiar with the Julian calendar. That's the basic calendar, the civil calendar that we're living according to. But very few of us are familiar with the fact that this Julian calendar was calculated in the year 45 before the Common Era as a result of the Roman conquest of the land of Israel and Syria and Egypt. They said we can't work with those lunar calendars because you cannot pre-calculate anything. We don't know in which day the moon would rise and at what day should we collect taxes and pay salaries, we need a workable system which could be pre-calculated. Julius Caesar, then he was not Caesar, he was only a king, Julius was convening in Alexandria scholars of all denominations and all religions. They set number of years and they devised this 365 and a quarter calendar. You know, that's the reason that every February we have, uh, every fourth February we have an extra day. That's the quarter because you cannot have a quarter of a day in the calendar. So every fourth year you have to have 29 days in February. Anyhow, the new solar calendar of the Roman Empire is the third calendar that we're talking about. The first one is the ancient biblical priestly calendar of 364 days. The second one is the Antiochian Greek lunar calendar with no fixed number of days based on lunar observation. The third one that I just now presented very quickly is the Julian calendar from the year 45 before the Common Era. But that is happening within the land of Israel. The Romans had conquered the land of Israel, as I said, from the year 67 before the Common Era. That's a very hard century. At the end of this century, half of the first century before the Common Era and half of the first century of the Common Era, it's a very hard time. This is the time that the new party, known as the Pharisees, is coming forward as a result of the, con as a result of the conflict between the ancient priesthood, the Zadokite, and the new unofficial priesthood of the Hashmonians and the Roman conquest. All of that together had paved the ground to the rise of the Pharisees, Pushim. Now, what is Pharisees? What is Pushim? Pushim is de derived from the word Lifroshlahem al Piadonai, to interpret for them according to the words of the Lord. To interpret. Pushim means interpreters. And there is a great difference between Pushim and Kohanim. Kohanim priests are writing and arguing that everything sacred and everything holy has to be written. The Pharisees, Pushim, are arguing exactly the opposite. They say that the most important thing is the new oral law, the new interpretation, the new oral deliberation. This is a complete innovation because until until the first century before the common era, there was no such a thing as oral law. The Pharisees had introduced the word tradition, Masoret, which is not a biblical word, and the oral law, Torah Shebel Peh, as against the old priestly order that by that time was a very evil priestly order. It was the Hashmonian priestly order and the Herodian priestly order because the Romans were nominating Herod and he had invited unofficial priests to serve in the temple. On this background of great political chaos, the new party known as the Pharisees, later on as the rabbis, would come forward and introduce the idea of oral law, the idea of a new perception of holiness, the new idea of tradition, and the most important thing, the new calendar. But that had happened only after the destruction of the temple. The temple was destroyed in the year 70 of the Common Era. It was a tragedy in every possible aspect. Jerusalem was ruined, the temple was ruined, but the outcome of this complete catastrophe was a new order. The priest of any kind could not offer any response to the new order because if there is no temple, there is no priesthood. There is no place to calculate the old priestly calendar. There is no place to do the sacrifices. There is no place to keep the ancient scrolls. There is no more temple. The only group that could step forward and offer a solution to the catastrophe was the party known as the Pharisees, Pushim or Rabbis or Tanaim. It's all the same. The meaning of this new party is let us introduce entirely new order. What did they do? 
They closed the Bible. They said that there is no more prophecy. You cannot write anymore. They said instead of writing, you should start to interpret. You should start to deliberate oral laws. And there is a profound difference between written law and oral law. In the written law, you don't discuss the identity of the authors. You discuss the holy scriptures. In the oral law, you don't have any text. You have only teachers. Thus, every sentence in the oral law would be starting by Rabbi Akiva said, Rabbi Shimon said, Rabbi Ishmael said, because the teachers are those who sang different traditions. In the old priestly law, there is never a name mentioned by who is the writer of the teaching, because it is considered to be divine law that humans are recording, and there is no importance to the identity of the recorder. There is a great importance to the sanctity of the scriptures. So the ancient priestly tradition, with the solar calendar of 364 days, had described utmost importance to written tradition, including the written calendar. The new group, the Pharisees, the rabbis, had ascribed the highest importance to oral deliberation, to interpretation of the legal scriptures, and they said that they have to be sealed. There is no such idea in the biblical collection itself. There is no reason why the Bible should be sealed, why what had been written for a millennium should stop to be written. What is the last biblical work in our collection of the Bible? It's the book of Daniel. It was written in the year 165 before the Common Era, before the results of the war with Antiochus. 165 before the Common Era is the last biblical book. He's telling us in a literary way about the conquest of Antiochus He's talking about a king who came forward and had desire to change laws, order, and calendar. That's Daniel chapter 7. However, from the time of Daniel, second century before the Common Era, to the time of the sages, early second century of the Common Era, three calendars had changed. The ancient priestly calendar was dismissed. The new Antioch Antiochian Greek calendar was introduced for 120 years in the time of the Hashmonians. Third calendar was the Roman calendar of 365 and a quarter days, introduced in the year 45 before the Common Era. And after the destruction, the sages said the following, we don't want to live according to the Roman calendar. We want to keep our own identity. We cannot live according to the priestly calendar because there is no more temple, there is no more service, there is no more sacrificial service. There is no more point to keep the ancient priestly calendar when only priests can calculate divisions of time. We need a new calendar. So then they devised a new calendar, which had a unique principle among all the calendars in the world. The principle is, we will never tell you anything. We will, ne <laughs> we will never tell you how many days are in a year. We will never tell you how many days are in a month. We would never tell you what's the principle of calculation. We would keep it all secrets, and we would nominate Beidin, we would nominate a court of law that would decide and decree it according to our own decision, not according to any pre-calculation, not according to any preset principles. We would decide when the months would start and when the months would end. We would decide. Now, when did they decide it? When is it first mentioned? In Mishnah Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah as a holiday is first introduced in Mishnah Rosh Hashanah. Mishnah is the literature of the sages. It was written down much later, but it was orally kept and orally recited from the second, early second century of the Common Era. What do they say in Mishnah Rosh Hashanah? They tell us in a very complicated way that in fact there are four Rosh Hashanah. There is not only one Rosh Hashanah, there are four Rosh Hashanah heads of the years. And they start to tell you all kinds of legend, there is this kind of Rosh Hashanah, there is that kind of Rosh Hashanah. But I ask you a simple question. When you are paid taxes, do you choose to pay according to your Rosh Hashanah or the government is telling you, well, you would pay taxes with all due respect according to the calendar of the country where you live. That exactly was the system with the Romans, with the Greeks, with the Egyptians, with the Persians. The government is dictating the calendar always and everywhere. Now, every individual group may choose to have its own calendar as an addition, but you pay taxes according to the ruling government and not according to your own religious identity. Now, if you would ask today, where do you think the people who set the calendar in the state of Israel are sitting? In which office would you suggest? Hmm? Which one? No, no, but in which government, in which office of the government, the people who decide the calendar are sitting? 
No, not in the Treasury, not in the Office of Religion, not in the education, no, they are sitting where they are expected to sit, in Misrad Rosh HaMemshala, in the office of the Prime Minister. Although, you know, you may say the calendar today is a combination between the Greenwich time and the World uh, Julian calendar and so on, nevertheless, the calendar is dictated in the office of the Prime Minister. With all due respect, I don't know where the American calendar is being dictated or written, but it's presumably in something of that sort, in the President office or something like that. But the point of the matter is that the ruling the new ruling group was the sages after the destruction of the temple. And they wanted to clarify in a very clear-cut way that time is no more a subject of priestly calculation, that time is no more part of the sacrificial hegemony order. Time is in human hands, and this is very clearly declared in the story of Mishnah Rosh Hashanah, in a story that many of you have heard or read about, the story where Rabban Gamliel is ordering Rabbi Yoshua to come to him in Yom HaKippurim that is falling according to his, Rabbi Yoshua, calendar. How could that have happened. What was the story like? It goes like that. Rabban Gamliel, who is the representative of the new order, the order of the sages, is declaring the beginning of the new months, the seventh months. This is most important months because that's the months of Memorial Day and the months of Day of Atonement and the months of Sukkot. You need to calculate it very carefully. For a thousand years, the seventh months always started on Wednesday. So the first of the seven months, Memorial Day, would always be on Wednesday. Thus, Yom HaKippurim, Day of Atonement, inevitably would always be on Friday. That's why it's called Shabbat Shabbaton. Always would be on Friday. Sukkot, which is in the middle of the month, would always be on Wednesday. Rabbi Yoshua, who was a Levi, wanted to help Rabban Gamliel to declare the month starting on Wednesday. But Rabban Gamliel had received a testimony on the new moon, which had caused him to err in his calculation. Rabbi Yoshua is trying to convince him that he should change his ruling. But Rabban Gamliel says to him, I don't want to hear what you have to say. It doesn't matter if you are right or wrong. I am the order now, and I would dictate when the month would start. Even if I'm wrong, I would dictate it. Rabbi Yoshua is crying bitterly because he understands that that's the end of the priestly order. Rabbi Gamliel is telling him, not only you would accept what I say, you would come to me in Yom HaKippurim according to your own calendar, in the Day of Atonement according to your own calendar. You would come to me with your money and with your purse, with your cane, and you would do everything that you may not do in Yom HaKippurim in order to show that it is not Yom HaKippurim according to the old calendar, but it is Yom HaKippurim according to the calendar that I dictate. Rabbi Yoshua is crying bitterly because he realized the consequences of that decision. This is the end of the old order. He's crying and the student, Rabbi Akiva, is telling him a very important insight. He's telling him the following. Let me offer you an interpretation on the key verse of the calendar. In the book of Leviticus chapter 23, it is said, and I'll say it in Hebrew and then I'll translate it, Ele mo'adei Adonai mikra'ei kodesh asher tikre'u otam b'mo'adam. Those are the holy days of the, war, of the Lord, holy festivals appoint, in their appointed time that you should call according to their appointed time, those are the holy days of the Lord. Now Rabbi Akiva said, instead of saying, those are the holy time of the Lord that you should call in their appointed time, he said, you, 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 you even if you are mistaken, you even if you are erring, you even if you are deliberately mistaken, you will decree the time and not anybody else. Now what does it what does it do? For that we need a tiny bit of Hebrew. In Hebrew the verse is said, Ele Moadea Donai Asher Tikreu Otam be Moadam. Otam means they, the holidays should be called in their appointed time. Rabbi Akiva reads it as Atem. Ele Moadea Donai Asher Tikreu Atem. Atem Afilu Shogegim, Atem Afilu Mezidim, Atem Afilu Toim, Atem, Atem, Atem. Those are the holy time of the Lord that you should call, you should call them, even if you err. You should call them even if you are deliberately making a mistake. You should call them even if you are just mistaken without intending. You, you, you. So this 
interpretation, which is offered in Mishnah Rosh Hashanah, in Babli Rosh Hashanah, and in other versions, is the moment when the calendar has changed. This is the moment when the Jewish people had decided to invent a new order. When you start in the seventh month and not in the first month. When you cut the time according to the lunar calendar of observation and not according to the solar calendar of calculation. When humans, everyone, can, be, can give testimony and the court would rule according to a testimony about the time of the moon. Nothing in the Bible tells us that the moon should be taken into calculation. And in fact, in the ancient versions of Genesis that were found in the, among the scrolls, it is said in the story of the creation of the luminaries, where in our tradition it is mentioned that the sun and the moon should be taken into consideration for declaring time, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it is said that only the sun should be taken into consideration because it is a solar calendar. However, what do you need in time of a lunar calendar? Lunar calendar, basically, it's about 354 days. You miss quite a few days for a full solar year of 365 and a quarter. What do you need to do? You need to add an extra month. Shana meuberet. To add an extra month. Is there any reference in the Bible for an extra month? Of course not. There was no extra month in the biblical order because the biblical order was a solar calendar order of 364 days. But the sages who had edited the Bible had erased every place where where it was said explicitly that the year has 364 days. Now, they did not want to intervene in the biblical tradition. That was holy scriptures. But the only topic that they took the freedom to intervene in the text is the matter of the calendar, where in our traditional story of Noah, the story of the flood, if you'll read it carefully, you'll see that it is a story of a calendar. It is mentioned when Noah started the, st uh, started the voyage, when he ended the voyage. It is a whole year. In the parallel tradition, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it is said, and Noah had stayed in the ark a full year, 364 days. It is said explicitly. But in the traditional version, no such number is mentioned. The word 364 days is not mentioned in the Bible, but it is mentioned in the book of Enoch and in the book of Jubilees and in Genesis in the scrolls, the story of the Bible, and in various other sources among the Dead Sea Scrolls. So people may argue, people may say, it's not the sages who omitted it, it's the priest who had added it. We may say that. However, we must say that the priestly literature is earlier than the rabbinical literature in thousand years. Because all the biblical tradition was written in the course of the first millennium before the common era. While all rabbinical tradition was written in the course of the first millennium of the common era, the priestly literature is much more ancient, really in thousand years. So in the biblical traditions which were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. A year of 364 days is mentioned time and again in various sources, time and again. In the letter known as Miktzat Maaseh Torah, which means a little bit of the Torah writing, the first chapter is how to calculate the calendar. And they say, the first month starts on Wednesday. The first holiday, Pesach, is on Tuesday in the 14th of the first month. Chag HaMatzot is in the 15th of the first month. Next holiday, it is Shavuot in the 15th of the third month. Next holiday, Memorial Day, is in the first of the seventh month. Next holiday is Day of Atonement in Friday in the seventh month. And last holiday is Sukkot in Wednesday in the seventh month. Now, it's most important for them to say that every holiday has a day and a date, while in our biblical tradition, no day and no date is given to many of the holidays. We know, of course, on the Memorial Day, which is what the book of uh, Leviticus is telling us in this chapter 23, but we don't know that there are four memorial days, which correspond to the first of the first, the first of the fourth, the first of the seventh, and the first of the tenth. Each one of them is a Wednesday. Day. Each one of them is referring to the following. The first of the first is the vernal equinox. The first of the seventh is the autumnal equinox. The first of the fourth is the longest day of the year. And the first of the tenth is the shortest day of the year. That was the foundation of the calendar for thousand years, where every day had a date, where every holiday had a date, where the priests were calculating it with great care and importance. But all that mathematical, mechanical work was intended for one single thing. Holiness is about eternity. Eternity is about time, cycles of time. Counting cycles of time was most holy because that what promised cycles of liberty and education. Mo'adei Kodesh means holy 
times, holy convocations, holy festivals. But Mikra'e Kodesh means times of reading, times of convening to read together. Mikra means reading, Likro means to read. In those holy convocations, every seventh day, every seven holidays, every jubilee year and every sabbatical year, the idea was that work should be cut and reading should be celebrated. Enslavement to work should be stopped and celebrating of reading should be inaugurated. The idea that holiness is about not working, because in Hebrew, as you know, avodah and avdut, work and enslavement, comes from the same root. We were always called to remember that work is a curse and work is enslavement when it is enforced upon you. It is a blessing when you choose it. It is a curse when it is enforced on you. What was the nature of slavery? When the Jews had no time of their own, when they were not allowed to keep anything, when they were not allowed to make any choices about time, liberty, work, enslavement, when they were enslaved. That's the reason that our story starts with we were slaves in Egypt for so many hundreds of years. We were liberated by God who gave us this calendar of days of liberations. I said before that the sevenfold divisions of the calendar is called in ancient sources Mo'adei Dro. It means appointed time of liberty. Keeping those appointed time of liberty every seven days, every seven holidays, every seven months, every seven years, and every seven sevenths of years, that what had kept us as a nation from antiquity until today. That combination of cycles of free time, which are dedicated to scholarship and reading and teaching the whole entire community, that is the reason why we are still capable to read the sources of our forefathers and foremothers, and while other great nations are lost in oblivion. Think about it and when next time somebody asks you what day is today, you'll ask according which calendar. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, what's that? Oh yeah, I, I'm. I'm sure everybody here. The question now is, with the implications of what we have just heard over the last two weeks, what do we do now? We, we do. Yes, we do. Um, um, look, at the, look at every other language, or many other languages, look at what Saturday yeah. name actually means in those different languages, and they're all Gary, would you mind manning a uh, microphone so that the people watching on live stream can hear what people are saying? <laughs> Um, look, there's no way, and you guys should know this, there's no way that we can ditch what we have and start all over from scratch, okay? Like she said, the original biblical calendar was maintained and determined and implemented by the priesthood, and there is no priesthood. Um, I mean, we, we have what we have now, for good or bad or whatever. Um, it is what it is. Uh, we can know the truth. We may not agree. Um, you know, the, the, thing, the thing that was most um, telling to me, really, was all of the historical uh, information as to the changing of um, the guard, basically. And where did we come up? Because, I, you know, guys, I have scratched my head for decades over where in the world did the rabbis, I mean, I know to some extent the history of how the rabbis came to be 
but how did they end up in power? How did they become the ones that were determining everything for everyone and making all the rules and, and all of that? And I've known and I've taught here, you know, that we didn't want to just take the whole thing, the whole ball of wax and chunk it. But there's a lot of stuff in the rulings of the rabbis that are just not right. And you can know, just any person who studies any of that, after a little while you start going, things are not adding up here. Um, it can't be the way that this particular rabbi or that particular rabbi said that things uh, are. And, you know, it, it doesn't really take a, a, uh, a rocket surgeon <laughs> to figure these things out, you know. And, and so... So what do we do? We continue. We continue with what we've got until Messiah comes. And He's going to set everything straight for everyone. And it's unfortunate that we have to do that. Um, but, but all of the current arguments over which calendar to follow and, and I, you know, this community is doing it according to this calendar and on these days and that community is doing it on, on a different set of days and you know that one's doing something in this month and the next one is doing it in the next month and all of that kind of stuff. Folks that is all absolutely after learning this information it's all moot. Okay. Arguments over calendars today is you're wasting your time. Okay. What we should be following, and we can't, is the original biblical calendar maintained by the Zadokite priests. And what, you know, one of the things that I asked the question about was, um, okay, so we have these two groups in the Bible, in the uh, Brit HaKadoshah, in the New Covenant Scriptures, we have these two main groups that are kind of battling one another. Um, that Yeshua, this is the uh, Yeshua and the Talmudim, this is the milieu in which they exist um, at the time that they're alive. They're dealing with, you know, what has occurred afterwards. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so the Hellenists obviously were not correct. But then they were just replaced with the Hasmoneans who were just as bad, um, if not worse. Uh, they happened to be, they happened to be uh, by lineage, uh, descendants of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, but their belief structure and so on was not godly. It was not based actually upon the Word of God. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, by the, by the time, that was really the only way that things could be done. Um, and she said they bought their, bought their positions. By that time, under Roman rule, that was the way it was done. I mean, there was no other way. Uh, other way. They were not going to bring the Zadokite priest back. Okay, so, <clears throat> but my, I, I've always scratched my head over this, the Sadducees because I have known for many, many years that the word Sadducee actually comes from the Hebrew Tzedukim, which is a derivative of Zadok, Zadok priests, okay? But knowing that the Zadokite priests, knowing what the Zadokite priests believed um, as far as their, their, you know, they believed in angels, um, they believed in the supernatural, they believed in the resurrection, um, you know, all of these things that the Pharisees believed, but the Sadducees didn't. And it's like, wait a minute, if these how do you call these Sadducees if they don't believe the same thing as the Zadokite priests believe? Okay, 
how, how did we get there, you know? And so, uh, Hank ha just so happened to be reading a book um, at this time, which goes right along with what we're listening to and what we're studying and discovering together. And so he sent me an excerpt <coughs> from a book called Ancient Mysteries of the Essenes um, from the Ken Johnson collection. This is from page 16. And it says, history records that about 110 BC, the Roman and Seleucid empires recognized Israel as an independent state. At that time, John Hyrcanus the first started a campaign of conquest to capture neighboring nations and city-states and force them to convert to Judaism. Forced Gentile conversion is forbidden. He also took the title of high priest and king, which was also forbidden. The Jews who felt that they should follow the high priest, no matter what he says, became known as Sadducees. Even though none of them were Zadok priests, they took their name from the Zadok priestly line. So basically they just hijacked that name. Right. The remaining Zadok priests were in Qumran at this time. Those Jews who felt the need to follow the Mosaic law refused to support this high priest. They became known as Pharisees or dissenters. This calmed down when um, Aristobulus became ruler, but flared up again when Alexander Janius became the next ruler. <clears throat> Alexander Janius continued the practice of forcing non-Jews to become Jewish, but went further in requiring all Jews and non-Jews under his control to start practicing some of the Levitical priestly regulations. This led to an all-out war between the Sadducees and the Pharisees that lasted over eight years between 96 and 88 BC. Even after the war, there were flare-ups and sub-factions developed. Everyone claimed to be the rightful rulers and kept trying to assassinate the leaders of the other parties. The Dead Sea Scrolls say at this time all of Israel was walking in madness." End quote. That's, that is the environment into which Yeshua and His Talmudim were born. Okay? So, there's a lot about um, about history and about how things have developed we just don't know anything about. That was the reason why I felt it was absolutely necessary that we listen to Dr. Elior because we needed to know the truth about how all of this came to be. So the, even, so, so let's forget the the Brit Shah for a moment and just talk about what is known as the Tanakh. That, even that book, those 24 individual writings compiled, canonized into a book, that even is not correct. And before we ever get to the New Testament. So, we what we are tasked with doing is doing the best that we can to serve our God with what we have available to us. And whenever we have this kind of information that can enlighten us and help us to understand this, the situation, to me, um, the more we can find the better because we need to know the truth. Even if we can't do anything about it, we at least need to know, okay? So, uh, we've got one back there, we've got one over here. <clears throat> I just um, wanna say thank you to God because we know that angels partner with us when yeah. we say Psalms and we praise the Lord. 
and it was demonstrated through this. So thank you for that information. Yes. Right. Uh, well, he, uh, Hank was one. Anyway. Okay. Um, I wanted to um, get up closer <laughs> to your mouth. <laughs> I forgot where I was <coughs> going. Well, there was one thing that I was thinking about when uh, we were listening to this uh, about the calendar, especially the one that requires the sighting of the moon. You know, we've always heard uh, that uh, when, when Yeshua says no one knows the day or the hour, everybody says because no one knows when the moon is going to be spotted. So right. I guess that's not true because we're originally, he originally would have been on the solar calendar. Is that correct? That's correct. That the, was his calendar. The, the unfortunate thing is we're going to now begin, all of us are, be, are going to begin, these things are going to start coming to the surface and we're going to be, be saying, well now, that belief is not correct and that belief is not correct. Yeah, so we're, really no our life, Our life is going to be that. So okay. no one really know, does know the time or no, the hour. No, there's not, I, I don't think there's a single individual on the face of the planet that knows the true day, date, etc. okay? Everybody's calendar, no matter who has created a calendar, they're all wrong, period, okay? The other thing I wanted to note was that Christianity says, you know, they, they criticize the Pharisees, but actually Yeshua's theology aligned with the Pharisees a whole lot more than the Sadducees, you know, because the Sadducees did not believe in an afterlife. They did not believe in angels. And right. um, that's why they were sad, you see. Yes. <laughs> um, come on. Uh, let uh, Hank say what he, what he would like to say. What ultimately brought this to, to light, if you will, was I was listening to this, but because we had discussed canon right. several weeks ago under the Sole study that we're doing, I thought that was something important. My focus was not the calendar, although that was Dr. Rachel's or Dr. Rachel Elior's focus her sub-information about how the canon came to light was the reason why I sent it to him. Although the calendar is an issue that she's bringing up, and I am looking at this different one, the Zadok calendar now, it makes much more sense after listening to her and reading through it, it makes more sense. That doesn't alter the fact that there is that one question about the um, Yom, Teruah and the sighting of the new moon. I'm, that's where I'm going to be going on that one and, and searching that out, trying to resolve that. There's a few questions that come about. But also well, and, and I would add that there is instruction from Hashem to observe Rosh Chodesh, which is a new moon celebration. Correct. So it's not like the moon is totally disregarded altogether, but Anyway, go Correct. ahead. Correct. Uh, and we've even had discussions over the subject of the calendar. I my personal opinion this past year was we were off a month. And the reason was we started the new year 13, uh, seven days prior to the, so the vernal equinox. So the question came out, Gary asked me, what was the reason for this? I said, really, to, to discuss the subject, to number two, recognize that different people are trying to follow God in their different ways. And what does the Father see? He sees people desirous of following his ways. And I don't need to be getting into a fight with Gary over a day. That's ridiculous. Because in reality, every one of the Moedim can not be followed because part of them deal with a temple. Right. Most of the things based with it is around a temple. So 
Everything is simply remembering his ways and trying to understand his ways. Don't get into dis di fights. Dialogue is great. Discovery is great. But we need to be seeking his way in every instance. Yeah. Uh, Nathaniel would like to say something. I actually have my own microphone. I don't know why I did this. Oh, no, I took it off. Oh, that's right. OK, OK. Um, just a thought on actually what you just said. There's a chance that with the whole thing about not quite knowing the day or the hour or whatever, not knowing the time, I was just saying to them, might actually be a de deeper, uh, deeper comment in that he knew that he understood that the calendar, it w well, was already messed up. And so from that standpoint, like what Hank just said, we don't know, like you just said, we don't know when the actual holy days are. This is actually a way to keep us from getting as close as we could if we had more information. Um, so in a way, that might have been a deeper, deeper comment on everything's so messed up, you ain't going to know when I'm coming because you actually don't know when it's supposed to happen. <laughs> you know. But he knows. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. And the Father knows. Yes. So therefore, it's along the lines of we'll be on the right Well, he won't be returning not. until the Father says anyway. So. Yeah. The season, yeah. 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 I think we can all say that we're getting awfully close. Um, and Paul won't. Well, oh. I did. Yeah. And I can't, I can't imagine I'm the only one, because Paul did bring this up. Paul John. Uh, Paul John, Andrew. yeah. Specifically on Hanukkah, because Hanukkah is not commanded. Um, based on what she said about this is actually a memorial of the changing we avoid certain things based on admixture. We've talked about, we've talked about that. Mm -hmm. So it does beg the question, what, what is... Specifically with Hanukkah? Hanukkah, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, clearly, you know, the Hasmoneans being in control as opposed to the Zadokites being in control, that's obviously not necessarily a good thing. However, the Hasmoneans did overthrow Antiochus Epiphanes and put him and the army out of the land and they did rededicate the temple. So it is a, it's a valid uh, remembrance. Uh, and we've al always known it's not a holy day from the sense of uh, the Bible doesn't say any, yeah, it's just, it's a remembrance of what God did through the Hasmoneans in routing Antiochus Epiphanes, so. And, and one of the reasons I asked the question, and I don't even, one of the reasons is so that you could say to me, you say to them what you've been saying. Right. It's kind of the idea of it was good, it just didn't go far enough. Kind of the idea. Right. Yeah. Uh, Paul wanted to say. Yeah, I mean, the uh, scripture does tell us, though, that when you know, about the holy days, that, you know, this is when you put the sickle to the, the grain and all those, so there are markers, ag agricultural markers that right. we could go by, yes, I, I, it seems to me it, it, it Yes, but it requires, again, it requires certain things. You have to be in the land of Israel. You have to be planting the crops according to the cycle that has been established by the priests in the temple, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these things are connected to one another. So me as an individual, I can't just go out. I, I can't just go out and pick a day and plant my barley, and then say, "Okay, well, the barley's ripe to this point, and now I declare, I declare when, that it's a vive." Okay, I I don't get to do that as a, as just an individual who's living in America. Um, so there's a lot. All of these things are like interconnected with one another. So. In order for us to be able to do those kinds of things, the entire system has to be restored, which is what Yeshua is going to do. Okay. Um, I was just going to add an extra comment concerning Hanukkah, in that also it's a recording of the miracle of the oil 
of the burning of the oil and the lamp. Yeah, that 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 is more than likely not myth necessary. and legend, okay. and not actually true, unfortunately. So, okay, that's another one of those uh, stories that the rabbis created. But it was the rededication of the temple after it the. It was the rededication of the temple, it, so. and it was a cleansing. so that is historical that's fact. Kind of parallels the dedication that Solomon did only a month later, with yeah. which is what Sukkot is, you know. Yeah. Okay, uh, Nathaniel, you don't have a microphone, so nobody else is hearing this except in the room. And, and he's back, going back there to him. Right. I have been looking at the Zadok calendar, and one of the things that is the premise of it in the scrolls in Qumran was the first thing that has to happen is the vernal equinox. And according to the understanding there's three ways that can work. It either has to be right at the vernal equinox, but they did schedule it according to the scrolls of Qumran on the Wednesday before or after the vernal equinox. So in other words, the vernal equinox is the key, but 364 is going to move that day because you can't make up one and a quarter days. So you've got to accumulate those one and a quarter, and then they would add a week. So every six years, approximately, they add a week. So it's always on the schedule of seven, and it always set that way. So basically, it's concluded that it was like three days before or three days after the vernal equinox, and that's how that would adjust. So the key was always the vernal equinox. With that vernal equinox is this, the sun, and the stars are the setting points as the major timepieces of the watch, if you will. And so the fact is, at the time of the vernal equinox, as the sun is going down, Virgo, i.e. Betula, i.e. the Virgin, is rising in the east with spica, which is the word or the phrase for branch arising with spica or with barley in her hand. So mm -hmm. the sign is the stars in the heavens. 365 and a quarter days from right now, those stars will be in the exact same place. Yeah, and I, and I, would, I would say this. Everybody is so afraid of, of astrology and worshiping the heavenly bodies and all of that that people like just totally shun and stay away from all of that. Hashem said that he gave those to us as markers, as signs, so that we'd be able to calculate the things that he needs us to calculate so we do what he needs us to do when it's the right time. So we can't be afraid of those things. We just don't need to worship them or say that they are what determine our life, you know, uh, the horoscope and all that kind of stuff. That, that's not of God, but the, the heavenly bodies were given to us as signs, to, as markers. Can, so. can I uh, throw in my wet blanket? Because you know that's what I do. Um, I do, I do want, want all of us to be uh, skeptical. There's an old expression, doubt your doubts instead of doubt your faith. So from where we start, for example, this lady I thought did a really good job. I'm not anti her, but there were a couple of red flags. One, she said she was a textu textual scholar so she didn't uh, put in um, archaeology and stuff. Well, a lot of people do that. Now, textual scholars traditionally have done some actually horrible things with the scriptures. If you've ever looked at the document hypothesis theory and the critical, not critical race, but another one out there. Now, she did sound like she was a believer, but because of that background she came from, like her uh, dissertation about the Essenes being hundreds of generations there on the coast, archaeology won't support that. But since she doesn't look at archaeology, she doesn't care about that. Now, th the other thing that struck me that was she referenced Daniel as writing at 155 B.C., if, if that's what I heard correctly. The scripture, if you're a textual scholar, which she is, but she comes from that tradition that tatas the, the literalness of the scriptures, the text says he lived at about 500 B.C. So, so when you're reading people like that, and again, I thought she was an actual believer, not like from about 1900 or 1880 to about... 
1960, you couldn't get a job at a Bible college or a seminary unless you believed in textual criticism. And to believe in textual criticism, you probably weren't an actual believer in God because of the way uh, they had divided up the, the Bible. So do keep those kinds of things in perspective as we look and come back to what did Jesus say. When Jesus references the sons of light, who are the ones who wrote the parts of the scroll that she referenced the most, the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's 50-50. When it looks like he's addressing himself as I'm the light of the world, uh, uh, John 12, uh, John 8 is when he says that, but John 12 he says, be sons of light. Looks like he's saying, be like me. But then um, in uh, Luke, I lost the reference here, he, when it talks about the uh, uh, <clears throat> bad steward who was going to get fired so he gave away his master's stuff, he says, even the sons of light know how to, to make a way for themselves. So now he's being negative to the sons of light. So it looks like the political group that called themselves the son of, the of light, he wasn't a big fan of. So, so, but the, the idea, the concept behind the term, he, he was a big fan of. So anyway, what I'm saying is, is listen for those little things and then look them up because you're going to find things. Uh, Hank was saying that, the, the whole Daniel thing, that puts a lot of what she says in perspective and in question mark. So you've got to do that. So, well, and Yeshua was that was that way though with a lot of groups because of who he was. He had the knowledge of the Father, and he he knew the right way that things should be done. And so, when he saw people doing things wrong, he called it out, no matter who they were. I mean, he didn't he didn't. He wasn't saying, I'm a Pharisee and only Pharisees are good and, you know, no, he, he let all of them have it. So, um, no, matter, no matter what group they were part of, if they were wrong, they were wrong. And he corrected that. Uh, did you want to say? No. Oh, hold on just a second. Let Nathaniel, let Nathaniel go. Okay. Whoa. So, based on what I was saying when I was like, stop, stop, no one can hear you. Uh, I was just saying that one thing that is a benefit of looking at the example of Antiochus Epiphany and uh, Hanukkah and so on was it actually was one of the dress rehearsals for the ultimate um, right. e end of things because he actually went in there, set up a false god in the temple and sacrificed a pig. And I don't know if there's any other example of a pig being... Uh, sacrificed in the temple, save for, you know, That's and right. you know, once again, Antiochus Epiphany kind of says God in human form is one way you could actually look at that name. So this man thought he was God. So one could say he was a dress rehearsal for the Antichrist. The so, ultimate man of sin right. will come. Which yeah. we've had a few. Um, again, it goes back to the patterns. Right, yeah, it's patterns upon patterns. And then just based on what Gary was just saying, what you were saying, are you for me or against me? No. No. That's right. Yeah. The captain of the Lord's army, when, when addressed by Yehoshua, Joshua, Joshua asked him, are you for us or are you for the other army? And his answer was no. In other words, wrong question. I'm for, I am for Hashem. Right. I just had a, a small comment. It was about a lot of times you'll read in the Bible where it says, "In the the uh, Passover, the Jews," or and that kind of thing comes up. And you're going, "Why would they say that?" And now this kind of answers that. It's because their calendar was off, and and and, and it oftentimes too, it seems almost like he's being uh, hypocritical when he says, "You Jews." He's like, "Wait a minute, you're a Jew," but then but that's is because he's basically probably doing air quotes, "You Jews," because they bought their way into the. The well, a lot of the times where you see Yeshua, where it's translated uh, in the case like this, like you're talking about where he says, you Jews, it should have been translated Judeans, not Jews, okay? And, and he was very specifically talking about um, the Jews of the Judean area that were all part of this whole um, Hasmonean, uh, Hellenistic thought processes and all of that kind of stuff. And, and of course, you know, he and his disciples were from Galilee and, and the way that they were raised and taught and understood things was different, very different than the Judean uh, 
Jews. So, yeah. Yeah, so. Did you want to say something? Okay. Uh, what was that? I was just fascinated by the, um, the explanation of the 364 days, uh, the way she broke that down, and how it fits into the Sabbaths and the Jubilees. Yes. And all that. that was very fascinating. And the fact that the Jewish, the Jewish people are the ones who will still speak that language, as opposed to all the other groups, that, that's never been, never been kept. And I wonder if that's because of the commandment of the Lord to teach it to the next generation. So that was just very, to me, that was very fascinating when she broke, broke all that stuff down for us. Right. Yeah. Um, to consider the 364-day year and how it all divides up into, into sevens and multiples of seven, you would think maybe God planned it out. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. Sorry, this is going, I, I keep, we keep coming back to conversations we've already had. Um, I actually was just talking them last um, Shabbat, because we were talking, or two Shabbats ago, talking about how there's so much to chew on, and so much you have to, we don't know, and you have to go discover, and so on and so forth, and you could actually spend all your time doing that, but when you practically look at life, you, you can't, and that basically especially if we go into a, a time of uh, crisis, to eat, you have to work. To do all that, you have to do all this stuff. You can't be constantly in a book, you know? So how, how, how do we do this? And, and we've often talked about how our culture has moved toward basically shamanism, where we set up a shaman who says, I'm gonna do all of this, and all of you are gonna go do your work, and then you're gonna come back and just feed off of what I've learned and that we've talked about, that's not how it's supposed to be. And, but asking the question, how do we keep from that? How do we not set up one person and say, you're just gonna be the one that does all the studying while we do all the work because we're in crisis. And it was, and it was this, this whole like, we condemn that, but I get how we get there. And then she talked about the whole, just that the whole idea is to have the people study. And it was like, Dude, yeah. she just answered. <laughs> the year off so, is not right, to right. just, you know, sit so, you know, yeah. in the shade. It's, it's <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of times, a lot of times the Jews are, are uh, denigrated for being so strict about keeping their calendar, about keeping Shabbat and the holy days and so on. You know, why do you have to always do it? You know, just be so strict about on Shabbat, you don't ever work and you know, all of these kinds of things. Well, when we know the reason why it was established by Hashem, this is what preserved the people of Israel through the situation like the Holocaust. Because even in the midst of the persecution, they still kept the Shabbat. They still kept the holy days as much as they could, uh, remembering all of these things that God had instructed them to do. And, and it is what preserved them. So the whole idea of when things get bad, you let all of that go by the way, absolutely not. In fact, it probably becomes even more crucial and more important in that kind of situation. Also, something, sorry, man, this is really hot because I'm right there. Um, I, I made a comment, too, to Ted about what she said about the different cultures, and they're gone now, and you don't have people speaking those languages. You don't have people doing that. We're watching in the American culture. We are about to fall into the very same thing that she just described with all those other cultures where they die and wither away, and you don't hear about them again. If you look at how we're doing stuff, the reason why kids are not being taught they're being indoctrinated, but they're not being taught how to actually do arithmetic and so on. You can actually look at how they're doing arithmetic right now. It's meant, it is designed to confuse. It is designed to get you to where you don't actually learn. You're just running around in circles. You look at how things are being done. And it is because what they said, the whole thing is 
if you can't, if literacy is the, the power of the free, illiteracy is what leads you into slavery. We're watching that happen and we're about to be one of those, the, one of those key, like empires that if, crumpled in on itself. And if you study history and you, and you look at the pattern that leads to the end of the different empires. It, it's, it's repetitive, okay? There is, there is a pattern, and we are following that pattern here in the United States. I mean, we're, we're well on the way to becoming a defunct um, empire, just like the Roman Empire and you know, all of these other empires that no longer exist. Yes? True liberal arts was actually the study of what was written and reading, understanding, and, con and deciphering with intelligence instead of rote regurgitation of facts. Right. A thought, a pattern, reason, logic, and ability. One more thing in the melu of, of Yeshua, Herod was an idu man basically of Edom, the mm. firstborn of um, Isaac, I'm sorry, the firstborn of, yes, firstborn of Isaac, correct? Yes. Side note to that, the firstborn of Isaac by marriage covenant was in accordance with the firstborn of Abraham because Isaac or Edom married daughters of Ishmael. Yeah. Huh? Right. Yeah, es Esau was of Jacob and he married Jacob. daughters of Jacob. Ishmael. Right. The, other, the others were Canaanite yeah. women. Yeah. So, yeah. Pretty uh, heavy stuff from the standpoint of not not heavy as in emotionally heavy, but uh, heavy as far as the weight of the information is concerned. Um, and so, uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, uh, do a closing prayer, and the uh, then follow that up with Birkat Kohanim, and we'll move on with our day. Um, yeah. Um, so, Father, we just um, even if even if the information uh, leaves us with more questions than answers, Father, we thank you for the information that we have heard over the last two weeks revelation that it has given to us and we we do need your guidance Lord God to know how to proceed into the coming days father we don't we know that we don't need to just absolutely deconstruct 100% of our lives and try to reconstruct um, we know that that is not the answer um, but Father, there may be some um, modifications and we just don't know, we don't see yet. So guide us, Father, as you see fit according to your Ruach HaKodesh and according to your word. And we will do the best that we can. In Yeshua's name, amen.